Today's lecture will be, uh, this is the seventh lecture. Remember today we have two lectures um, and tomorrow is the last one. Um, today we'll, uh, the lecture will be about close to equilibrium conditions. So systems that are driven out of equilibrium, but uh, the force that is uh, driving, driving the systems out of equilibrium is weak. And uh, there are very interesting results for this situation. Please remember that what I have been explaining was general, was for any force, any degree of non-equilibrium. And today I will um, focus on stochastic thermodynamics of systems weakly perturbed out of equilibrium or weakly perturbed out of a non-equilibrium steady state. I will also think about a system in a steady state in which we apply a tiny time dependent force, right? Uh, okay, so before starting, um, so I have divided my lecture in two parts. The first will be a lot of math and uh, theory, and the second will be experiments about these results. Uh, before starting, I'll, I'd like to, to request uh, if you have questions, uh, if it's not a problem for you to, to <laughs> switch on your camera, this way, if it's not a problem, of course, this way I can see who is making the questions and it makes this course uh, much more human, all right? Uh, fine. So. Um, I'll go now uh, to share the whiteboard because I'll do most of my calculations uh, this way. So, uh, okay, so today, lecture seven, I will start with a um, very well known result in, in stochastic thermodynamics, which is uh, the so called Harada Sasa equality. Uh, okay, so this will be my first result I will, I will discuss the Harada. Sasa equality. This is an equality that connects a dissipation or entropy production with how much a system does violate the fluctuation dissipation relation. Okay, this is a very nice result. And um, okay, this is found, for example, in papers by Harada and Sasa uh, in PRL. This was the first. Um, Contribution was in PRL, Physical Review Letters, 2005. Um, another one is in PRE in 2006. I highly recommend you to go to the PRE. Uh, to be honest, I've, I've gone through uh, both and I understood much better this one. Uh, however, this one was the first in which they introduced this result. And also a fantastic work also by Harada, only, okay, this is also Harada and Sasa, and a fantastic work by Harada, uh, which is in PRE. Uh, in 2009. 2009. Okay. Uh, this is Takahiro Harada and Shinichi Sasa, if you want more um, information. All right. So uh, I will show an equality for, for a group of systems, which is non given dynamics, but this is, can be generalized to, to more situations. And recently, there has been also a generalization to field theories. Okay. So I start with a non given system which is the following, uh, it's overdumped, there is no mass, or the mass is very small, there is friction from the, from the bath, there is an external force, okay, a force which could be um, conservative and non-conservative, then there is a perturbation, which we will call this one, epsilon, fp, this is a time-dependent force that is applied in the system, epsilon is a parameter that we will say it's small, and finally there is the white noise from the thermal bath, okay. Remember, this has zero mean and autocorrelation given by uh, two gamma kVt. Okay, I'm, I'm not being very, uh, okay. Remember, this is a delta function. So. All right, so what is the path probability? The probability for a trajectory in this model. The path probability, uh, which I usually call it like this, the xt, for a trajectory, any tra trajectory, x0 up to xt. Okay, I'm assuming time is continuous. What is the path probability? This is my question. So uh, I already told you about this because in the end, here the stochasticity comes from the noise. So the noise is a sequence of Gaussian random numbers that come one at a time. And this implies that we can write the conditional path probability like this Pxt given x0, this is the initial state, this is the probability of the full path given the initial state. <laughs> Okay, I hope you're fine. Uh, dxt, this is uh, equal to d of xi times a normalization constant times exponential of all this, which is 
the following. It is minus, uh, sorry, I made a mistake here. Okay. This you can find it in the book of Schulman on path integrals. You can also calculate yourself. Uh, I just give you the result here integral 0 to t of this minus this minus this square. This is coming from the fact that this is Gauss. Okay. So this would be gamma x dot s minus f x evaluated at s. Uh, minus epsilon f p s to the power two and then ds okay this is the probability for a trajectory in terms of okay remember this is a way this is in reality a limit because we are thinking about um, continuous time is the limit when when the delta t between every uh, two observations is is zero of the x zero up to the xt, and this is the same with the noise. So this is d xi zero, d xi t. Okay, but these are just differentials. But what it's uh, the most important thing here is this factor here. Okay. So having said this, so this is the priority for a single trajectory. S is trajectory. Please, please go. I say that S denotes trajectory. Uh, sorry. No, okay. S, S is a time instant. So I'm integrating, it's a dummy variable. I'm integrating S from zero to T. Okay. S is an internal time variable. So I have a trajectory. Okay. 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 Any other question? Uh, there's a question about the Jacobian. Yes, the Jacobian comes out of the ratio between these two, and it also comes here. Okay. But uh, it is not, uh, it's something that is independent on, on the trajectory itself. But uh, if you want to be extremely rigorous, you should put the Jacobian. But for what I'm going to do next, the Jacobian is not playing any role. This is the main point. But yet, if you take into account the Jacobian, exactly here. Okay. This is a normalization factor that depends on, on the system parameters, for example, on KBT, on gamma, and it comes also from the Jacobian. You should put here the the determinant of the Jacobian in transforming side to x. Okay. Uh, other questions? No? Okay. Sorry, but I, I can't follow the chat. Uh, I don't know why, but it, no, it it's says... okay. I'll, uh, I'll follow the chat. Chat. Ah, okay, okay. I, I have the chat now. Okay. <laughs> Fine. Yes. Uh, good. So, uh, now the question comes on given this this uh, system this Langevin dynamics what is the response function response function is the following response function function and i will calculate the response function for the velocity okay first of all i must say that i'm following very much this uh, pre paper that i'm saying and in particular within this PRE, pre paper there is one section which is appendix b so when you read papers don't forget appendices are very important, especially if there are new results and you want to look at the, at the mathematical proofs in appendix B, which is uh, called quick derivation of the equality. Okay, so I'm following, I'm trying to follow the, the shortest path for the, um, for the proof, okay? Quick derivation of the equality. Okay, what is the response function? The response function is defined as follows. So what we will do is to compute what is the average velocity in the perturbed system, which is this. So the average velocity will be x, x dot t for value epsilon in the perturbation will be nothing but, okay, is the average of x dot. So the average of x dot, we can write it as, uh, this is the path, the uh, differential of the path, probability for a path given x zero uh, times x dot, okay? This is it. Okay, this is the way we, we write explicitly the average of x dot. What is the response function? The response function can be found by doing the following, by making the functional derivative of x dot t at epsilon with respect to the uh, external force, so the perturbation, which is this. Okay, so I will calculate what is the functional derivative of 
this object, which is x dot, with respect at time t, with respect to a perturbation at time s. And be, be um, very conscious that you can have a perturbation at time s, which is before than t, and this will impact on what happens later at time t. Okay, that's why I'm putting here two time indices. When you do this, um, you, you can figure out, and it's, it's not so complicated to, to show that this is equal, just, you can show it from here, because you can do just the derivative with respect to this. This is an exponential, so when you take a derivative of an exponential, uh, and then you say epsilon f is small, we will then say epsilon is small, you, can, you just get from the derivative, just the argument in the exponential. So, all in all, what you get when you do this derivative is just this x dot at time t. Okay, is this Stratonovich product with what comes here without the, the epsilon? So it's just x dot s minus f xs. Okay, this is just this derivative, this functional derivative. And then uh, we should be careful on what does this average mean? The average is done in the ensemble in which we have epsilon, okay? This is the derivative, how much the velocity changes, the average velocity changes when we are setting this value epsilon. So this, that's what we denote by this, okay? This is the first calculation. So once we know this, we can define uh, the response function as follows. The response function at t minus s uh, is... Excuse me. Yes. Please. Sir, why was uh, it Stratonovich? Yes, I'm using Stratonovich, okay? Because uh, here, to, in order to have this nice form and that this does not depend on, on the trajectory, uh, it is more convenient to use Stratonovich. Okay, and I can, I can integrate this equation in Stratonovich perfectly. I can use uh, two different okay. types of integration rule. I am using Stratonovich. Just because for the sake of calculations, I think it would be much easier because I will just use standard rules of calculus in, in my derivation, okay? So I'm using standard rules. Okay, thanks. Right, perfect. Good question, actually. Okay, so what is the, the response function? The response function is just the, the limit when epsilon goes to zero of this quantity, okay? How much the velocity is changing when you have a very, very tiny um, uh, response, okay? So we will do the limit when epsilon goes to zero of the delta x dot t with respect to um, epsilon f p s. Okay, this is what I want to calculate when epsilon goes to zero. You can figure out that, okay, this is very, very uh, evident that when, when epsilon goes to zero, what you can get from here is just the same thing, but here at zero. So we will do this average when there is no force. So this means that uh, we will have beta over two gamma of x dot t in Stratonovitz product x dot s minus f xs. Okay, this is in the zero. Okay, so without any anything. All right now, uh, I can write this um, in, in the following way. I will use now. Uh, the so-called velocity autocorrelation function, Cv t minus s, which will be the following quantity. It will be the stochastic velocity at time t minus the mean velocity times the stochastic velocity at time s minus the mean velocity. Okay, and this is in the system zero. Okay, for epsilon equal to zero. I'm just saying, what is this v is the average v bar is nothing but e x t at c. All right. So when you write this, this uh, becomes x dot t, x dot s. This is the first term, which is what it's is appearing actually up here. So this is uh, appearing here. X dot t, x dot s is here. All is doesn't know it, so that's why I'm not putting. Anything? Well, let me put a circle just to be, you all to be very picky. Uh, we just put a circle here. Okay. First thing is this. And then there is x dot t with v, x dot s with v. This is the same thing. And then there is v with v. So x dot t average is v. 
So there will be minus v squared, minus v squared, and plus v squared. So what you get at the end is minus v average squared. And this is in a system two. So you see, from this equation, I can continue uh, up here. Okay, I'm using uh, this equation here. And what I get is that x dot t, x dot s is the correlation function of the velocity plus v squared. So it becomes beta divided by two, uh, and then v squared plus c t minus s. Uh, and then we have minus beta divided by two gamma of um, the rest, which is x dot t starting of its f. Okay, good question is that s. F well, the question of why is the average velocity independent of time? Yeah, good question. But uh, you see, uh, when you put here epsilon to zero, what you have is a, um, it, it, it's a system that has no, it's a stationary state. So what is happening here is that you have a force that depends on X, so it's like a potential that doesn't change in time. You have the particle which is doing like this, but then you are averaging with the distribution of this, this potential. So if I average over many trajectories, this won't depend on time. So I'm doing the stationary average of the, of the velocity. It's in the end, it will depend on, on whether this is just conservative or not. If you have a particle in a ring and you do x, s dot, x dot t over many trajectories, uh, you will have a net velocity. If you are only in a potential, if this is just partial u of partial x of u, this average velocity will be zero. Does this uh, reply your question? Um, okay, I mean, uh, I still am not clear, but I think uh, I can try it. Okay. Okay. This idea. <laughs> okay. 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 Anyway. Um, okay. So this is the average over um, over many, many, many infinite trajectories in uh, a time t of a system that has no time dependent. So it's not there is not a, here um, as an independent driving. It's either an equilibrium system or a non-equilibrium steady state. This is very important. That this process for epsilon equal to zero. And let me just remark this. For epsilon equal to zero, the system so is either an equilibrium system, equilibrium dynamics, or non-equilibrium steady state. Okay, this is, will depend on the nature of f. If f is just the derivative of tensor, so f is just minus partial x of u, we will have an equilibrium dynamics. If f is the derivative of tensor plus an external force, we will have an, the amplitude system is a non-equilibrium state state, okay? This is for epsilon equal to zero. For epsilon positive, we have a driven system. So we have either an equilibrium system that is driven or a non-equilibrium state state with driving. So it's either equilibrium or non-equilibrium state states, state state plus drive. Here, x dot of t depends on time. So this partial t is non-zero. Here, because we are in equilibrium or non-equilibrium state state, the net velocity equals to zero. Okay. I hope this satisfies a little bit <laughs> the, the, the question. Let me advance because otherwise I would not be able to, to uh, explain the key result. So, uh, okay, so we continue with this. Be, uh, just be aware that here there was a gamma that was killed in this part, okay? In the second part, it's, it's surviving. Very nice. So this is the response function at t minus s. And now what I, I will do is I will sum the response function at t minus s plus the response function at s minus t. Okay, what is the response if at time t, if I apply a pulse at s and plus the opposite? If, we, if you take this equation and sum um, t minus s and the case of uh, s minus t, you get, first of all, the following, beta average velocity squared plus c t minus s. Okay, here I'm using the fact that the um, velocity velocity autocorrelation function is 
uh, even on entire reversal. So C of T equals C minus T. Okay. So C of T minus S equals C of S minus T. That's why there are two factors here. Right. This is one. And then uh, the second part has T S and S T. So we have minus beta over two gamma uh, x dot t x t okay and uh, uh, it's f says uh, plus x dot s it's f x t okay so this is what we get and both are in the unperturbed system. Okay, so this is the average of x dot times f. It's not x dot, so this is uh, something else. It's very important. Okay, so now uh, what I'll do is I will do the limit when s goes to t from below. Okay, if I do this, I get uh, something like 2 r0 uh, because s going to t minus or s going to t plus, uh, s going to t basically. That makes that uh, t is equal to s, so we are evaluating the response at time zero, becomes beta b squared plus c zero, the autocorrelation function of the velocity. These are correlation functions of velocity, yeah? very important. Uh, minus, and then t equals to s on the right is just beta over gamma uh, x dot t. Statonovich f x t, okay, at the same time. And then this is at C. Okay, so I don't need this part, and this is the main equation. So in reality, I could stop here and tell you this is a fantastic equation which relates uh, uh, dissipation with um, breaking of the flotation dissipation relation. But if you see this um, this equation, you won't see it uh, very intuitively. So just keep this in mind, and let me just introduce something quite um, relevant to this. The Fourier transforms. So, and I think there was a there was a question about it. So let me try to to explain now. Okay, so this is our main equation, and I'll try. I don't know if I can copy this. Uh, I, will, I will do make a try if I can copy this equation. Okay, I think I manage. <laughs> it's always quite complicated to <laughs> learn a new technique every day. This okay, edit. No, I cannot paste it. <laughs> this is all so bad. Okay, so I take this and I uh, copy. No, I cannot copy. Okay, so I copy by hand. Uh, okay, the result was the following. The result was uh, 2R0. So twice the response function of the velocity at time zero um, equals beta e hat squared plus uh, C0. Sorry, this is not correct. Correlation function at zero, uh, minus beta over gamma of x dot t, Statonovich f at x. T. Okay, in the unperturbed system. This is in the perturbed system. This is in the unperturbed system. This is the equ equilibrium correlation. So correlations in the unperturbed system response when you weakly perturb the system. And this is an average in the unperturbed system. All right. So now I introduce the Fourier transforms in the in the same way Harad and Sosa do in the paper Fourier transforms. So I'll first um, define, for example, the Fourier transform for the autocorrelation function, which is uh, I'll define it as follows in this convention: dt over two pi minus infinity to plus infinity of ct. E i omega t. This is in the way uh, they define free transforms in this paper. Okay, just be aware of one thing that is that um, this is in principle um, complex because this is real and this is a complex number, but c of t is um, symmetric. So it is even with, with, with respect to time reversal. And this is cos omega t, which is even, plus i sine omega t, which is odd. So if you multiply, C, sorry, even by even, yes, sorry. Okay, someone is calling. <laughs> uh, if you multiply even by even, 
this should be non-zero. And this, if you multiply even by odd, the integral should be zero. So in the end, here we will just get something like this, dt over two pi, c of t, cos omega t. Okay, this means that uh, c tilde omega is real. That's only a real path, okay? This is the first thing. Uh, the second thing I want to say here is about the response function. So the response function, the free transform, I'll call it like this, uh, the same way, dt over two pi, r of t, e i omega t. So it is not guaranteed that the response function is real. In general, it has uh, both real and imaginary parts. This is very important for you to, to realize. And when we were doing this limit here, when we were doing this limit, we were doing s going to t minus. In reality, when we here, when we do the limit s going to t, we will have, in reality, this is not very well explained, but this should be 2r0 in reality is r0 plus plus r0 minus, okay? If I am going to be very, very mathematical with this. Okay, so when you do this and you have this, um, uh, this definition, of course, uh, now the r t minus s will be the inverse Fourier transform. So it will be the omega over two pi uh, r Fourier transform omega e minus omega at t minus s. Okay, this from minus infinity to plus infinity. Now, what we are interested in is r at zero plus plus r at zero minus. And this becomes, uh, you can show very simply, this becomes the integral d omega to pi. Uh, please realize that here t minus s, t minus s. If we put t minus s equal to zero, is the integral of the full, uh, is, is this integral with e to the zero, which is one. So r zero plus plus r zero minus, becomes uh, this times two, and this is the real part, okay? When I put a prime, is the real part of the Fourier transform of the response function, All right? This is one thing. And another thing is from here, you realize that C tilde, sorry, not C tilde, C of zero, okay? So the main result will be this one, but now I'm going to write it in a more fancy way because I'm going to use this free transform. And C zero is nothing but the integral d omega two pi of C tilde omega, okay? So of course this is, if I put here uh, omega, sorry, uh, t to zero, uh, sorry, not, not here, but in the inverse Fourier, it's the same thing as here, you get this one. So this means, okay, this, this means that this part, um, this part here, all this part, I will change it by this. And uh, this part, I'll change it by this. And uh, I'm, I'm just missing one part for the equality, which is this. This will be, uh, okay, x dot f. And this is not so difficult to show that x dot f, it's nothing but minus the heat dissipate in the system, okay? In the Ampere-Torf system. Of course, the Ampere-Torf system, Ampere system is uh, either equilibrium or non-equilibrium steady state. If it's equilibrium, here Q dot is zero. There is no dissipation of heat. If it's non-equilibrium steady state, it is not. Q dot is negative in the state C, okay? So this is equal to this. It is not so, I mean, it's not just one line to prove this because what I showed in, in my previous lecture was that this is equal to minus F X dot, okay? But you can show that this is equal to X dot F. And I leave it to you as an exercise. Uh, it is a nice exercise. So you see that in, in this equation, we have R zero, which is response, C is correlation and this is dissipation. So when you put all of them together, you get this very beautiful equation, which is the following. The heat dissipated in the Ampere-Torf system is a prefactor, which is the friction coefficient times V squared plus the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of D omega divided by two pi of the correlation function of the velocity omega minus 
to kvt the real part of the velocity of the free transform of the response function of the velocity um, in the respect. Okay, so look at this equation. It's, it is really beautiful and really um, insightful because it says the following. The dissipation of the amperture system is related to two things. First, the net velocity. This is like the drift. Like gamma v squared is when you have a particle in a fluid moving at a constant velocity, its dissipation will be gamma v squared. This is the naive part. And this is a measure of the extent of the violation of the fluctuation dissipation relation. Okay, so here is an equality connecting dissipation because this at the end in this system is the end reproduction rate in units of kV connecting with violation of the fluctuation dissipation relation. Why I'm saying this? Well, because um, there is, um, when we have Q dot equal to zero, which would be uh, equilibrium systems, this implies, okay, also V, v bar is zero, and uh, we have C, V omega equals two kVT R prime omega. And this is the so-called fluctuation dissipation relation. This was proved by Kubo uh, quite some years ago. You can find it, uh, okay, not in Japanese. The Japanese uh, are, are very strong in this, in this topic. In report log FIS in the year 1966. It's a very important and classic result in statistical physics. Okay, so if you go to the paper of Kubo, you won't find it uh, written like this. You will see here the imaginary part, but this is because he writes, and very many people write often the correlation function for, for X instead of for V. So that's what it brings me to the conventional, conventional formulation of the formulation of, of the fluctuation dissipation relation, which um, in fact, uh, so we, what we are doing now is uh, autocorrelation function of velocity can be written as this Fourier transform of, um, of V, Fourier transform of V at minus omega. This, uh, you can show that this related also to the Fourier transform of X in this way, minus I omega, Fourier transform of minus at minus omega. And this shows that this is imaginary unit, i times minus i is one, and then it's omega squared. So it's omega squared, x tilde omega, x tilde minus omega. So this means that the autocorrelation function of the velocity at omega is omega squared, the autocorrelation function of x at omega. Okay, this is a very simple result to prove. Another analogous result you can show is that the response function in the velocity is Okay, just remember the velocity is x dot. This is what, what just is behind all this. Is just i omega, the uh, response function in x at omega. So this implies that the imaginary part of the um, velocity to correlation function is omega times the real part of, of the autocorrelation function in x, okay? Oh, yeah, I think I made a mistake here. Uh, I think, okay, this is the real part. And here, okay, here we are relating imaginary with real, and there's the same analogous with uh, real and imaginary. So all in all, if you want to write this one, you want to find out what happens in Kubo's paper. Kubo doesn't write it like this. Kubo writes it for X, and for X, the conventional formulation is like this, CX omega equals, instead of two kVT will be an omega square, two kVT divided by omega square, imaginary part of the response function X. Okay, so you can also write Harada Sasa instead of in terms of response function of X, of velocity with response function of X. The only difference will be that here you will have to put um, X and here, omega squared 
This is response function of x and imaginary part. Okay, so if you go to the literature, you will find both formulations and they are equivalent. This is what I want to say. All right. So with this, I am done with the result. Um, I don't know if I have time to the other concept I wanted to, to explain today, uh, which is also related to fluctuation response. Uh, okay, I'll try to go through, and if I don't manage, um, I explain you more later in the second part of the lecture. Uh, this is a very also exciting topic, which um, has a very funny name, which is the following: is the frequency. Okay, frequency. The frequency is a concept introduced uh, by different authors, and um, for instance, Christian Miles has now a review on this topic. Uh, in the physics reports, physics reports, 2020, uh, and there are also very good papers about this. Also called okay, this is now the most accepted name, but there are other names such as traffic. There is also activity, etc. Okay, and there are other. Um, Relevant authors in this um, in this topic, which, uh, for example, Marco Vallesi, uh, he has very very beautiful papers on this topic. Wynats as well was the PhD student of of Christian Maes. Um, Urnabasu as well has very nice papers. I did one paper with Pier Paolo Vivo as well. So there is a growing community uh, working on, on this part. And okay, let me try to explain what it is. So I told you before that. Um, the probability for a, a trajectory has a form, and typically we can write the probability of any trajectory as follows. This A will be a so called axon, will be a functional of the trajectory, and P0 will be the probability of the same trajectory in another process. It will be a reference process. Okay. So in other words, I will define AXT as um, the logarithm for the probability uh, in a reference process to see a trajectory divided by the probability in the process of my interest to see this trajectory. All right. So one particular case is when this one, when this one is the probability uh, in a, a conjugated with the time reversal. If we do this, A will be the entropy production, but this is more general what I'm going to explain. Okay, so uh, first of all, um, I can show you that uh, one can, if you want to do an average of xt, x at time t, uh, this will be nothing but, uh, well, in the measure p, this will be, you can do it like this, average over all trajectories of x at time t, probability of the entire trajectory. Here it could be something else. It could be a function, it could be anything else. And you can also write this as the average of xt um, with e to the minus a. So e to the minus a is like the way you change measure with p c, okay, xt. So you can um, do the average of anything in one process and a uh, Using this A, you can do the average in the other process. In other words, um, in other words, A is just a change of measure. Okay. Now uh, it comes. What is the so-called frenzy? So what I'll say is that I will um, split A in two parts. One that is even under time reversal, and the other which is odd under time reversal. So I will say that A, it, it will be D minus s divided by k. Okay, s is the same thing I explained you before, which is the entropy production, and d is this new object that is called frenzy. Well, actually, better instead of calling d, because I use d for diffusion coefficient, let me use another word, another symbol that I like more for, for this object, which is phi, okay? Phi is the frenzy, and s is the entropy. Okay, so, what are the two things that, that characterize this? Object? So the entropy, as we said, is a functional that is even, uh, odd under time reversal. So if you measure the entropy production of the time reverse trajectory, you get 
minus the entropy production of the original object. However, so this is the entropy production. And what is the frenzy? Frenzy is the symmetric part of the action. So the frenzy obeys, okay, I did everything with D and now I have to trace back. The frenzy is as follows. When it applies to the trajectory, it takes the same value as when it's applied to the time reverse trajectory. This is called the frenzy. Okay, why it's called frenzy? Well, I, I can really, um, the best is to look at examples, but it is because it's related to the number of jumps that are happening in a trajectory. So the entropy is related to the irreversibility, but frenzy is related to how many jumps in any direction are happening in your, in your trajectory, okay? But this is easier to see with examples. Uh, okay, so now, uh, knowing this, what we can do is uh, compute the probability for a trajectory divided by the probability for a time reverse trajectory in a non equilibrium steady state. Okay, this is very easy because now we say this is E minus phi uh, xt minus S xt divided by kb, and now divided by E of minus phi of the time reversal trajectory minus S of the time reverse trajectory divided by kb. Okay, first of all, phi of xt and phi of xt uh, reverse is the same. So this goes away and you just get an um, E to the, okay, I think I was missing a, a, a factor two here. Missing a factor two, and <laughs> I think I mistake, I am mistaking the sign here, okay? Because if I take the sign here with a plus, uh, okay, if I take with a plus, this becomes S xt divided by Okay, so, and this brings back to the definition that I uh, introduced uh, in my course. And this is S dot, okay? S X dot XT is KB times the logarithm of the probability for a trajectory divided by the probability for time diversity. Okay, this is consistent with this. All right. However, um, what if now you uh, make the product? So if you do probability for XT, it's a time in the chat. Yes. Are the results of the conventional the same as Kramer's chronic relations? Uh, I must say, I don't remember. Um, I don't remember which were the Kramer's chronic relations. Oh, yes, they are. Okay, it's fine. Especially <laughs> always uh, linear response to you. Okay. <laughs> good to know, but uh, I don't I didn't remember this. Uh, good, good point. Thank you. All right. This times. So now if you make, instead of the ratio, you make the, if you multiply the, this times this, the entropy production cancels because this is equal to minus S XT. And the only thing that survives is uh, the frenzy. So you just get minus two phi XT plus. Okay, so in other words, uh, the frenzy it's for a trajectory is related to something more weird, which is minus the logarithm of the square root of p x t times p x t bar. Okay. Of course, you see this doesn't make any well, physical sense because you see that the distributions path probabilities have units. So the only thing that makes sense is the change in frequency. So if you do this, the change of this quantity, you do d well as as many quantities in in. Uh, in thermodynamics, if you do d at t minus d at zero, uh, what you do is basically you will have minus the logarithm of the square root of p xt, p xt bar, and then uh, p x zero, p x zero bar. Okay, so things that make sense are um, make sense are changes in in fairness. Okay. So this is not so important as uh, what I'm going to, to say next, which is that the fact that, okay, as I said before, the average of any functional of a trajectory, xt, uh, in the any um, we, with, with measure p, so we have a physical process, we want to know the average of the work, we can write it as the average of e to the minus a xt, so this is the axon, times the same functional in a reference process, wherever 
process we want, okay? And this A is defined between P and PC. This implies, and you can show this um, uh, easily, that if you have a weak perturbation, you will have the following, that this will be uh, similar or equal to, okay, we will develop this, um, sorry, there's some noise in the background. We will develop this um, uh, for A small. So then this will become one minus A times omega in zero. So this will be um, omega at zero minus A omega. So close to, um, for epsilon small, this will be the first contribution to the, to the response. And this you can show if you do, for instance, um, the response in this, in this way, the epsilon of omega xt at uh, epsilon, uh, and then this will be the limit when epsilon goes to zero of omega evaluated at the trajectory in epsilon minus omega xt in the amperturb system divided by epsilon. This is the definition of the derivative of how much it changes an observable when we have a weak perturbation, when epsilon is small. From this equation in the, in the, in the middle, this uh, is similar or equal than minus the functional xt times a xt. So this is trajectories, okay? In uh, the epsilon, okay? So this means that we can write the response uh, understood in this way as one half omega times s, s prime epsilon in epsilon minus omega times phi prime epsilon in epsilon. So it means that there are two contributions. This is derivative with respect to epsilon, by the way. There are two contributions. One is uh, an entropic entropic term. And the second is a frenetic term. It's a term that is proportional to the frenesy. And it, this is very important. It was a very important insight of, of this theory that entropy and frenesy for the response of any observable are equally important as you see. One is one half and the other is, is um, with factor one. So for instance, if you take in this example, omega equals to one, okay, this is the most silly. Um... Uh, Edgar, so I think there is a question. So uh, regarding the epsilon, so uh, the A should be proportional to epsilon. So probably you should have, have uh, epsilon time A, no? In these formulas. And uh, not necessarily, not necessarily because Okay. A, or, a, or here uh, you should have uh, the D A D A D epsilon. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, that's the point. That's the point. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot that. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. In the same way, we were doing um, the derivatives, functional derivatives, as here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, yeah. That was a typo. Thank you. Uh, very, very good point. Okay, that's why here there are these S prime epsilon. These are functional derivatives with respect to epsilon. Okay, so if you take omega equals to one, this is one valid uh, functional, it's the most silly you can think of. This um, implies, so of course, the derivative of one is zero. This implies this equation. Uh, okay, this is the, the central equation from this theory of, of uh, frequency. Okay, this is the key. Uh, result. So you put C1, the derivative of one is zero, and this one, what, what you get uh, out of it is um, the following. You get that the entropy minus the frenesy is greater than one zero. You can show this inequality very simply. Therefore, you have something like this in these systems, greater or equal than phi divided by two. So it is like 
a tight bound to the entropy production tighter than the second law. It's not only that the entropy production is greater than zero, but the entropy production is also greater or equal than the frenzy divided. It is sort of a second law. Okay, but let me go further because. Uh, Sorry, Edgar. Yes. Shouldn't it be twice the frenzy? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> I don't know, a mistake here. Yeah. S half, yes, yes, exactly. This is twice. Exactly. To be correct, this should be twice in the way I defined it. All right. And uh, let me just um, wrap up with, uh, which is probably um, the one that is um, thought as the most, um, the best application of the results, which is when you use as omega, you use a time integrated current, which will be called J. This will be a time integrated, integrated current, which uh, could be, for example, the position of a colloid could be the work up to time T. It's also time integrated current because you, you are summing the work over a different time intervals, the heat, into the production, etc. Okay, it could be also you have a Markov process with uh, four states, and you count, for example, every time you jump from one to two, you count plus one, and when you jump this way, you count minus one, minus one. This is also time integrated current. So you will have jumps when this is happening, and minus one when this is happening. And at the very end, if there are drifts, you will have this, it will be a time integrated car. Okay, you can apply the same uh, quantity, um, the same uh, relation, sorry, to, to the response of a, of a current, and it will be written sorry, in the same way. Uh, so you will get this same equation, but now instead of omega, you will have any current of a Markov, Markovian system. Okay, the response of a current will have this term that goes with the, with the entropy and this term that depends on the frequency. If the current is the entropy, you will have here a sort of an S square. So if, if J equals to S, this is a positive uh, contribution, but this can be negative. And this is very important when you consider uh, in examples. And one example that is very much, uh, okay, when you have this J, I'm going to, to simplify the notation very much. You will have that D uh, J with respect to epsilon is uh, J S prime divided by two minus G frequency prime. Okay, so why this term is important? This has, is being uh, discussed in the last years, in very nice papers. One I can highly recommend you with examples is the one of uh, Urnabasu and, and Maes, Urnabasu and Christian Maes. It is not in a very well-known journal, but it is very, very well written. I really like it. It's J, I think it's from an Indian conference. J Fizz Conf Cities, uh, 2015. It's a very, very, uh, very nice paper. I really like the, the examples. It's good for you to, to read it because you will see that frequency can be easily measured in, in some models. And, and then, um, we discuss, for instance, the following system, which is an active matter system. So imagine you have a system like this, where there are some obstacles, and you have some swimmers that are trying to pass these obstacles, and they have a drift. These swimmers are, of course, in an active bath, sorry, in a thermal bath, but the swimmers are, uh, imagine, self-propelled particles. This is a paradigmatic model of active matter. Okay. This type of dynamics can be described with simple stochastic processes, actually. And um, what happens here is you would say, okay, what happens when I increase, let's say the, the field. Uh, so imagine you put, for instance, a, a concentration gradient of food. Uh, okay, here it would be actually the opposite. So there will be a concentration of food along X like this. So bacteria would like to go where there is more food. Then, um, this will define a parameter, which will be the slope of this, of this concentration gradient. And this will determine the net velocity of this bacteria, no? at least if there is no these objects, these obstacles. So I would expect that when I put 
more and more gradient of, of food, the bacteria will move faster. But in some experiments, it has been shown that, okay, first the net current of bacteria, uh, when you increase epsilon increases, this is actually the effect of this part, you can, you can see. But then at some point when you, okay, this will be another situation with higher value of epsilon or, or concentration gradient. It can happen that there are, there are crowding events. So the bacteria uh, are not helping each other and they, op they, are, um, uh, they are obstacles to themselves. So it can happen that there are trapping effects here, okay? Some bacteria are passing, but when there are many, many people trying to go, there is here a, a trap. Uh, so there are trapping effects. These trapping effects can be captured by, by simple models and you can really uh, go to this paper and, and check an example. And this is a manifestation of, of frenzy because here there are a lot of jumps in all directions, which can be quantified with a, with a quantity that is uh, even at the time reversal. And this generates that when epsilon is large, you can have this type of response. So this is called, this region is called the region of negative uh, differential response. response. And it can be understood the best way by having this phonetic term in the, in the um, description. Without this, it is uh, not possible. So this type of dynamics will have a monotonous uh, increase. This would be without frenesi. Uh, it would be a monotonous increase of the current, something like this, but never uh, show this type of effect. So this is very, very important uh, for active matter systems, systems with excluded volume, etc. Okay. Uh, again, let me just remark that here there was a field. So it's like a field pushing in the Okay. Uh, I don't know how much time do you have because I wanted to show you experimental results, uh, some slides. Uh, maybe we can take a break of five minutes and then uh, I don't know, it's a good point now. Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, it's a good point. Um, but please let me know when do we stop the recording just to, to be sure. Okay, I stop the recording now. <laughs>